good afternoon and a big hello to all our fellow volunteers. Just to introduce you to ourselves, uh, my name is Pam, this is Jeff, and uh, Bentley, who's actually taking himself off for a little snack at the moment, but I'll introduce you to him a little bit later. Um, Bentley is a uh, Labrador, um, he's nine months old now, and he's been with us since he was seven and a half weeks. So he arrived just at the beginning of lockdown um, as a little tiny Andrex puppy, and now he's almost 30 kilos, and they tell me he hasn't really quite finished growing, so slightly concerning, he's gonna be a big lad. We've been volunteering for Hairy Dogs for about 12 years now. Um, we took it up as a retirement project. We were looking for something to do when we finished work and decided that this was a charity that we really would like to work for. We have um, a profoundly deaf son. He was born deaf and has no speech and actually is already on the list and waiting for a hearing dog of his own. So I'm a speaker, so I go out and do talks, uh, but I'm also a voluntary dog trainer. I'm gonna to explain to you what that means. I'll tell you a little about, bit about the journey through training um, the puppies through to partnership. At the moment there are 221 dogs in training and uh, various breeds. Now we use uh, various different breeds uh, but the ones that we found that work really really well are the Labradors, so yellow labs, black labs, chocolate labs, makes no difference colour wise, they're all very good, very easy to train because they are um, very food motivated so it makes them very easy to train. We also use, uh, for people who don't want such a large dog, we would use Spaniels, both the Cocker Spaniel and the um, Working Spaniels. So um, they make a nice little dog, again, quite high energy dogs, but again, quite nice to train, but quite fun sort of dogs. One of the other dogs we use is perhaps, perhaps be a little more surprised about is a Poodle, the miniature Poodle. And the reason for that really is one, that they're actually a very intelligent little dog, but also they have a coat that doesn't shed which means that if you have any sort of allergies, uh, you don't have to worry about um, fur all over the floor as I do with Bentley, because here, even if I look now, there's a fine sheen of fur all over, his, all over the floor, even though I only swept up about 20 minutes ago. Um, so if you have any sort of allergies, then a poodle is obviously good. The other thing we do is we take the poodles and we take the cocker spaniels and we cross them and we end up with cockapoos. Again, a very nice little dog, they come in sort of various sizes from quite little to actually quite chunky. So but again, very, very good for a really good um, hearing dog. They train nicely. So those are the four breeds that we've found over the years that actually work the best. Obviously, every journey starts with all of our volunteers. We have a huge band of volunteers who are saying hello to you now. Um, so they start. we start off with our breeding scheme. Most of our dogs are trained by our by hearing dogs uh, they are uh, bred by hearing dogs sorry um, and initially our the girls and the boys who we're going to use for breeding us are separated out from the dogs who are in training and they live with um, sort of puppy parents I suppose really and our brood bitch holders the, the people who hold our lady dogs uh, see them through their mating and through the actual birth and look after those puppies along with their mummy right through till they're eight weeks old. Um, and that's then where the socialisers come in. We used to be called socialisers, but we're now either called volunteer puppy trainers or volunteer dog trainers. And I'll make that a little bit clearer as I go on. So when the puppies are about eight weeks old, um, they move out away from their, so say, their, their breeding home and their, their mummy and their siblings, and they move into volunteer socialisers. Often they are volunteer puppy trainers who take on the dogs um, at uh, eight weeks old and basically come start their training from literally day one. So volunteer puppy trainers only have the puppies until they're around say 16 months or so and then they leave them to move into advanced training um, volunteer dog trainers on the other hand which is what we are actually still take the puppies at eight weeks but instead of them passing them on to somebody else to train up we actually keep them in our home and we train them and they go uh, directly from us to the recipient to their, their, their uh, deaf partner so they arrive at eight weeks old and from there we literally start from day one on their training. 
it's all the sort of basic training that you would expect from any sort of good dog really so we teach them all their normal we teach them obviously all their toileting um how to behave with that teach them their name teach them all their basic commands um and ha generally how to be a really good dog so that goes on uh, right the way through the whole of their time with um, the volunteers um all of our uh, commands are actually uh we use a voice command but because some deaf people don't have very good voices, we also have to teach the dog like a hand signal. So, for instance, we might ask them to sit or go down or to stand or to wait. But we'd also use that with hand signals. So we would use a, a sit or a down or a stand or a wait. So with various um, um, signals, basically. Also, again, if you are out in a park and you want to get your dog back and again, you don't have a very good voice or you're not a loud voice, um, you won't be able to call them, so we would actually train the dog to come to a whistle. So things like recall is always taught with a whistle command as well. All of our training is done uh, through positive reinforcement. Um, we don't actually, um, you know, if, if they get it wrong, basically, we just ignore it or we'll stop the training for the time being and go back to it again. Uh, positive reinforcement can be things like uh, food, to tell them they're really good, lots of fuss cuddles toys all sorts of things but we don't use any sort of negative uh training at all so we practice over and over again and to do that we have puppy classes which obviously normally would be face to face but at the moment we are um on virtual puppy classes which is quite an interesting way of doing it so they get all the training but without the sort of literally eye contact with other dogs because that's and that has been something that's been a little bit of an issue with the COVID because obviously they can't meet up with other dogs and other people so I think we did we did manage to get one class in that uh, was a face-to-face -face class but apart from that we've um they've all been virtual classes but they've been great during the training uh, during this first part of the training they actually have to um, get their what they call us dog star awards uh, puppy star awards sit thank you I don't know who's going to turn around and show you because, yeah, go down. There's a good one. Um, so we are working through puppy stars from the one star to the four star. And at the moment, Bentley's halfway through his three star. So pretty well on target for that sort of thing. As well as teaching the dogs how to behave really well and practicing all of those commands um, and getting them up to be really, really well behaved. We also obviously have to do the socialising side of things which means taking the dogs out and about to all sorts of different places um, to learn how, how to behave. So we would take them under normal circumstances, we would take them on public transport, we would take them to shops, we would take them to libraries, pubs, cafes. We, they need to know how to cope in all sorts of situations so that they can learn how to behave, not to be frightened by traffic, not to be worried by trolleys banging together in the, the supermarket, um, so again, we take them everywhere that we can. Obviously, again, with COVID, it's been very difficult because we've had to come up with quite innovative ideas. Um, interesting number of cafes we've had to have in our own home, which is just pretending to have a cup of coffee. Well, not pretending to have the coffee, but pretending it's a cafe and having sort of trying to get them to behave. So although he's doing well in most of his training, that side of things is a little bit slow for him, but, but just the circumstances and he will catch up with all of those things. So all the time we're going through that, um, obviously um, they're, they're learning all the time, but they're taking their star awards. And towards the end of the three star, um, that's when the matching process starts. And I uh, actually spent some time with his trainer last week, actually matching Bentley, um, talking about his attributes, and what he's good at, what he's not so good at, what he likes to do, what sort of dog he is, which will give, um, the people who do the, the actual matching a good idea of what sort of person he can go to. So normally at a, after the three star at around somewhere around 16 months, for some of them it's a little earlier, some of them it's later, depending on their character and how they get on. Um, if you're a volunteer puppy trainer, then the dog will then move at that point to one of the centres, either at uh, Bealby or in, um, at the Grange, and they will go there for their training. Now, they don't move into kennels or anything like that. They move in with other, another volunteer family, like a, a bit like a bed and breakfast family. 
who will look after them during the week and take them to school during the day. So they, they spend the whole day at school. So they dropped off at school in the morning and picked up in the evenings, spend the weekends and evenings with their new, well, a bit like foster carers. So that's another side of volunteering that you, some of you will know about. Um, for us, as volunteer, volunteer dog trainers, we actually keep those puppies on, so he won't be leaving us in the next few months. He will stay with us and we will continue to do his sound work. We're just starting at the moment with the very, very basics of him learning how to alert. So these are the sorts of things that he's going to have to learn in training. He will now learn how to um, communicate with his deaf person to tell them when something is happening. They learn that by using a nose nudge and he will actually use his nose. Will you use your nose? Good, can you do a nudge? Thank you, <laughs> he will. Um, so he uses his nudge, nose, um, normally try and nudge my knee, but at the moment it's still more trying to nudge my hand just in case there might be something in there to eat. Um, so he's learning his nose nudges and knowing what to do with those. Sorts of things he's going to learn is things like uh, when the doorbell rings, when the um, telephone goes, those all those sorts of sounds in your home. So it would be doorbell. Um, sorry. Oh, sorry. My husband's in the background. No, uh, the, the doorbell, the telephone, cook and timer. Um, um, lots of things that he can tell me about. If you've got a young family, you might have a baby, so maybe a baby alarm when the washing machine stops, all those sorts of things. Sorts of sound, everyday sounds that you're going to need. Um, to know about. And for those particular sounds, what he will do is what we call a leading sound. And so when the sound happens, he will recognize the sound and he will come and find, in this instance, I am his deaf person. So he will come and find me. He will tell Jeff, but only if I'm not around, but I am effectively his deaf person and he will work directly for that one person. That's a good boy. Um, so when this, for instance, the doorbell rings, he will actually run around the house, he will find me. Regardless of where I am, he will come and find me. I might be in the garden, I might be upstairs. Um, I could be doing anything and he's got to try and find me. He will come and find me and when, as soon as he finds me, he will use that nose nudge. For the smaller dogs, we teach them actually like a little scrabble up the front of your legs because obviously a lot of them can't even reach your knee, so there's not much point doing that. So they do this little scrabble. And at that point, you realise that they're trying to get your attention. It's a bit like a toddler going, Mum, Mum, I need to tell you something. And at that point, we use another another signal, which is, is, what is it? And then he will take me. He will sort of lead me off to whatever the sound is. So if it's the doorbell, he'll take me to the door, or if it's the phone or whatever, um, he will learn all the different sounds. Even if I'm upstairs, he will come upstairs. He will find me. He will come down the stairs, but he will keep checking to make sure that I'm still following him. If at any point I've given up and gone off to do something else, he will come back and try again to make sure that I do follow him to the door. When we get to the door, he will not, he will show me that it's the door. I can open the door. Hello, there's my friend. That's great. So that's really good. And he will do that for all those sort of leading sounds. So things like a cooker timer. He's just learned his cooker timer. He can just about do the cooker timer now. So that's his very first sort of sound. Um, but he will do it for lots of different sounds. And obviously these sounds can be... We have the basic range of sounds, but then eventually they'll be tailored to whatever the um, deaf partner wants. So if they have, maybe they take the dog to work, they may want fax machines, those sorts of things. So um, they will learn all the sort of office sounds. One of our previous dogs went to work with a lady in a school and he learned all the different school bells that meant different things. And sometimes she had to move and sometimes she didn't, and he knew which ones were which. So. Um, the other sound, obviously, they need to know is the alarm clock, because obviously you, you need to be able to get up to work in the morning. Um, if you can't hear your alarm clock, that's that's quite tricky. So for the alarm clock, when the alarm clock goes off, uh, the dog will sleep either in your room or certainly where he can have access to your room. And when the alarm clock goes off, he will come and he try he does the sort of nudging, but it's more like using his feet. So he puts his feet up on the bed, and then he's like paws at you to try and get you. If he can get a nose onto your arm, he'll nudge your nose, nudge you with his nose. But basically, to get your attention, again, you will say, "What is it?" This time, instead of going anywhere, he will just sit down next to my bed, 
and he will use his nose to actually point towards the alarm clock. So that shows me that it is definitely the alarm clock going off. It's not the postman, because if it had been the postman early morning, then he'd have gone off to go to the, for me to follow him. So I know that it's definitely the alarm clock that he, he's after. Of course, there's one other sound that is really, really important that they need to learn, and that is sort of, uh, the danger alarms. So things like the smoke alarm, um, <clears throat> and also a, a fire siren if you're out in a shop. Most of their sounds they do in your home or in your workplace. Those are sounds that are dedicated to you. So things like your doorbell. He won't answer the door in other people's houses, for instance. So he won't respond to that as, as long as they've got a different sound. Um, but for the smoke alarm, or the fire siren, in, I say out and about in shops or public places, he will uh, learn how to respond to those. And what he will do there, when the sound goes off, he will recognise that as a danger signal and he will run around, he will find me exactly the same way, he will nose nudge me and I will do exactly the same thing. What is it? Because, you know, I don't know what it is. But this time, instead of taking me to the fire, he will actually um, come in front of me, he will nudge me and I say, when, as soon as I say, what is it? He will then do like a down, but it's, it's much more definite than that. It's a sort of proper throw himself on the floor down. He's getting quite good at that. And he will stay there then until I put my hand in his collar, which means I acknowledge that this is a dangerous situation and we need to get out. So at that point, I need to get him out. It's not for him to lead me out. It's for me, him, me to get him out of that situation. So most of our... Um, Deaf partners say that actually that's the most important sound that they learn. But of course, there's something else, of course, that the, the, the dogs actually give, which is beyond all the sounds and things. It's something that actually you don't teach them. It's just something they know how to do. And that's how to be a real companion and a friend, how to be really supportive, how to, you know, if you have your own dogs, you know that they know when you're feeling a little bit down. They know when you're excited about something. Um, and they will be with you all those times. Deafness, as we know, is really lonely and isolating. And so by wearing that jacket when they're out and about, it gives the deaf person some visibility and confidence so that they will actually, you know, be able to take their dog to anywhere and know that actually, one, that people might actually recognise that they have a disability and they, have, they might need some for you to be a little bit careful about how you speak to them. And the dogs actually earn their working jacket at the end of their training. At the moment, um, Bentley is in a training jacket. So he says, oh, I'm learning to be a hearing dog. So it means that we can go into shops. We can go into cafes, um, mostly. It's not, it's not mandatory. We're not, we don't have to be allowed in. They can still say no, but people rarely do. So they can, can do that, um, continue to uh, do their training. During the whole of this period, all the period of all the, the, um, the training, the socialising, everything, obviously the matching is going on in the background. We've got some really clever people in hearing dogs who can match these dogs up exactly to get the right, the right match. And at around, I mean, usually perhaps about two years old, once they've finished their hearing dog accreditation, once they've passed all of their exams, they prove that they can be a really good working dog. They do, they earn their final jacket and they're ready then to move on into the world to be paired up with their deaf person and to move on from us to um, start a new life, basically, and to change someone's life. It's a bit tough on us because the question I always get asked at talks is how do you give them up? And sometimes I have to say, well, yeah, tearfully, but it's also joyfully as well, because we know that we've done a good job. The dog has done a great job. We know that the partnership is going to flourish. Um, and they'll be supported for the rest of their life in that partnership. And we've got 982 partnerships on, out there at the moment. So he's going to go and make another one of those, um, which is amazing that he'll be adding to their number. So basically, that's it. it yeah, tough, tough to let them go. We form a really tight bond with these dogs. Obviously, we're, we're with them literally 24 seven. So it is quite hard. But we do it knowing that they're going to go to, on to do an amazing job. Um, and that's what we're all in this for. All of us volunteer for exactly this purpose. And so I hope that that's helped you to understand perhaps a little bit about the training and, the, and the, um, how we get our dogs from tiny, tiny puppies right through to 
being partnered. So I'm going to wish you a really happy Christmas and hopefully a much better 2021 than it has been this year. So uh, from me, Bethany, can you say bye bye? Come say bye. Quick, say, can you say bye bye? Yeah. He said daddy, why haven't you? Yeah, come and sit here, beautiful boy. Come and sit here. And Bentley, say bye-bye. Say bye-bye. There we are. Okay, bye.